Yes. Here it is, an episode of The Grail, brought to you by my boutique guitar sponsor, Mr. Banker. Banker Guitars, get yourself a boutique guitar and uh, be cool like Marcus King or Scott from Rival Sons or Mastodon, handmade out there in the middle of America somewhere, the greatest guitar maker, Banker Guitars. Now, look who we got here. We got two faces. We got uh, my favorite thing in the background. I see some leathers. I see some uh, N1s. I see some Japanese clothing. And I start to go cuckoo. Introduce yourselves, my friends. Let's not all speak at once here. I'm Jeremy Smith. I'm co-founder, co-owner of Standard and Strange. Um, We've been doing this since 2012. Neil? I'm Neil Barrett. Also co-founder, co-owner of Standard and Strange. We're a menswear boutique specializing in the (laughs) rare and the best from Japan, Europe, and the USA. (laughs) We are a clothing boutique, not a menswear boutique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that again. Everybody wears our clothes. Yeah, that is true. That's true. That is true. Now, my story, of course, uh, addicted to Japanese clothing, um, love high quality i love the best i love rare i love uh looking different than you know the average person walking down the street and uh found out about your store on instagram uh, you guys were carrying the real mccoy's stuff and i love that stuff more than anything and then i finally visited you guys a few weeks ago and my head popped off uh, it right in oakland and it was two blocks away from where I played rock and roll and booked rock and roll for many years of my life at the Omni on Shattuck. So it was just insane to be back in the neighborhood and not even recognize it. I was shopping in your store, had no idea. I was two blocks away from, you know, ground zero of craziness back in the late eighties and eating sandwiches at Genova's and buying ribs at Flint's. And man, has that neighborhood changed. And uh, it was it was just an amazing experience to be at your guys' store. Let's talk about how the hell you guys got started and into this stuff. I mean, that's that's a long story, Dean, but well, it's a good one, though. Yeah, I mean, it goes way, way back. But like this chapter of the story started when I moved to California in 2005. And this has nothing to do with denim. This is like how did I get the bug to make apparel and to sell apparel? So I moved here. It's California. We're all outdoorsy every weekend. I'm out mountain biking, I'm trail running, I'm doing something outdoors and every jacket sucks. And me being me, I'm like, I'm going to fix it. So I go out there, tons of enthusiasm. I start talking to everyone. I'm like, how do I do this? I want to make this jacket. I have the drawings. I have the ideas. I know what I want to make it out of. And every single person is like, no, you can't do that in the USA or no, you, you can't, do that without investing a hundred thousand dollars or no, you can't do that without buying a shipping container full of them from China. And it was just like, no, no, no. And finally I was like, fine, I give up for now. This was before Kickstarter. This was before the internet had resources on like how to start your own clothing company. Like I had nothing. So I put that away. And then, you know, once you get the bug though, it sits there. And a few years later, I was looking around for a shirt. Like, I just wanted a button-up shirt to wear to work. Nothing fit. And I meet the guys at Taylor Stitch. So I start helping them for free. And I start meeting other people in the industry. And I just start doing whatever I can. I trade my knowledge. I do work for free. Just free, free, free all the time. And, you know, talk my way into factories. Talk my way into fabric suppliers. Do whatever I can to learn everything I can. And... Along that journey, I'd been riding bikes more and more, and this brand Rafa started. So I flew out to England, interviewed with them, but the job paid 45,000 pounds a year, and you had to live in London, which... Impossible. Yeah, it's like 2009. And, you know, even post-economic implosion, that was rent for London. That was it. (laughs) That's all you could afford. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I can't do this. But I was like... I came back and the wheels started turning. I'm like, well, I went to this factory that sews knits. I met this guy that makes custom knit wool knit blends. 
I'm going to make my own Rafa. I'm going to make my own cycling jersey company, and it's going to be great. And I'm going to sell so many of them. And so I start in on that. I start ordering stuff. I met a pattern maker at a party. It all came together. And this is where Neil comes in. I got stuck in the stupidest thing. Like I ran out of bandwidth. I got stuck in fucking zippers. And I could not for the life of me get, because I wanted to do it right. And this, this is a little bit nerdy, but you want your zippers to come from the factory, the right length for the garment. You don't want to cut them yourself and tuck them in or the garment fails. You just lost the $200 garment for a 25 cent zipper, right? So I'm stuck. And I'm like, and Neil's invested some money in the company and, and I'm, he's like, you need help? I'm like, yeah, can you help me solve the zipper problem? And we're off to the races, sort of. We make a bunch of jerseys. They're fucking incredible. People love them. People still ask us to this day, can you make more? And we're like, no, we don't have time. (laughs) I see them, you know, I see them being bought and sold on cycling forums and I see them out on the road still being worn. Great product. We forgot one thing that we have to tell people about them. We got to spend money telling people about them. So of course, you know where this goes. It started like we have a ton of product, but we're not selling it fast enough because we're not telling people about it and just starts to spiral down in sales. And we're not selling like it's selling. We're running out of money. But along the way, we had leased a space to use as our office right around the corner in Temescal Alley. And that space, we're stuck with it. And we're like, well, what do we do? Neil and I are sitting down. We're like, well, shit, we're running out of money. We signed this lease. We're not going to walk away. And I'm like, well, we've met all these people who make dope shit. We met everybody who makes denim and shirts and boots. And, you know, that's the moment where the light bulb goes off. We're like, well, there's no store like this in Oakland. And, and we're off to building the first version of Standard and Strange, you know, borrowed tools from the tool lending library, like, minimum amount of plywood cut up, built our own fixtures ourselves as best we could. You know, it's like, I'm a deck builder. I'm a set maker. I'm not a guy who knows how to build fucking cabinets. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just like in there with borrowed tools and plywood, like wing a prayer. And now how are you getting product back then to put in the store? Did you have money or were they fronting you the product or what was going on? And also how do you <clears throat> eat meal? Um, so riding bikes, right? The, bikes. Yeah, the cycling community su- was super tight out here. And we met on a cycling forum, started doing group rides together, started hanging out, and been friends since like 2007. And that's how we met up. We've been friends for years before the cycling company kicked off. Now, when you're starting the store, uh, and, and you're obviously minimal money. Do you have the people front your merchandise or were you was, just kind of doing mail order or what was going it on? Was, it was a mix. We borrowed everything we could. So we got as much inventory on wheels as we could. Taylor Stitch gave, lent, lent us like, God, I don't know, probably 15 grand in shirts on, you know, basically on a monthly payment plan. I think the guys at Telesin let us buy on a weekly replenishment you know, they're like, just buy sticks and you're, you know, buy like 32 through 36 in two styles. You know, that's chump change to us these days, but that's probably like a thousand dollars we spent on denim. Um, I think the guys at Topo lent us some bags, Red Wing fronted us, you know, it was a mix of like consignment payment plans, fronting and what little stuff we could afford. You know, wow. we literally, we probably had, I don't know, 20 styles. 25 styles in that little store. That was it. What was the vision for the store? Because you're coming from cycling jerseys and that thing into what I would call just one of the most incredible stores I've ever been into, uh, which is specializing in rare handmade uh, clothing. Like how did the vision change? Was it like some cycling still when you started the store? At, no? no, it was the initial concept was an all made in USA head to toe store, right? So we could get all of it, jackets, jeans, boots. And the thing is, that's a great concept to start with, right? But neither of us are ever satisfied. Well, this is good enough because you start learning, well, there's always something around the corner and you start looking under things. You start peering, 
into nooks and crannies and asking, well, is this the best? Is that the best? And that kind of took us on this journey where the store started going through these phases where we're like, okay, well, we're American only. But then we started to, you know, I had a bunch of Japanese denim at the time of my own. We started asking questions. Should we carry Japanese denim? What should we do? And, you know, these doors started opening for us as we discovered, discovered more brands. I started talking to brands I wanted. Neil started finding brands that he wanted. And it just turned this pursuit of what is the best? What is, you know, who is doing each of these? It stopped being about made in America and started being about who is doing this category to the absolute limit at which you can make it good. That that's that's genius, man, because that's really like, yeah, you want American made. But what I started finding was uh, with trips over to Japan, when I went to Japan, I'm a small, short guy and, you know, it, it could be made in USA, but it also can be that three size configuration, you know, medium, large XL or, you know, it's like here it's kind of fits, but it doesn't because we need it to fit a broad spectrum of people. And once I got to Japan, I was like, wow, this shit fits because I could custom order something, a leather jacket, for instance, and uh, I've custom ordered leather jackets for years from companies. And I'll tell them, I want the slimmest rock and roll fit. And they'll ignore you afraid that you're going to return it and they'll do one size up and you'll be like, Hey, this doesn't fit. Like I want it. Why did you measure me? I don't understand why we took measurements when this is not what I want. And they go, well, you can layer in this. It's like, I don't layer. I didn't say I wanted to layer. I'm going to wear this on stage <laughs> or, or whatever. I want to be looking like, you know, Jimmy page in the dragon pants. I don't want to be having, you know, bulky square outfits. So once I'm in Japan, I'm like, Oh, these guys get it. And now other people, of course, are really getting the, uh, it depends what era we're in, but the fitted stuff, of course, we had the hip hop kind of big stuff. Then we have the kind of oversized Supreme era stuff. There's all different fashion. I get it. But for me to look and feel good it has to fit real slim because i'm short and i don't want to look shorter by big wide jeans or too long or wide jackets and and all of that you know but with the japanese brands a lot of them we actually have to ask them to go bigger for us too because we sell a lot of big sizes right and you know there are there are a couple brands where i just don't get anything for myself because i've i sized out of wearing it you know like capital tops out at i'd say like a skinny guy at six foot right 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 but whatever now, you know yeah now neil were you working a job while you guys started the store and was this like a thing that you were doing also while you're uh getting the store started were you working a full-time real gig yeah throughout this whole saga with cedar cycling the cycling company and when we started the store jeremy and i both had full-time jobs and, but we were both working contracts. So there'd be like a month or two where we didn't have work and would go full-time at the shop and then we'd go get another contract and we'd sort of trade the yeah, timelines I mean, ended going- up aligning really well, but yeah, I had a full-time job doing radiation cleanup work. Wow. Wow. Like radiation spill. Like uh, old super fun sites that were mostly closed military bases that had radiation there that we had to clean up. what a crazy gig dude did you go in with like the fucking breaking bad suits and shit a couple times yeah most of the times uh the most we had were uh respirators but i did a couple jobs in nuclear power plants and uh that was a trip so when it starts off is it mail order website or is it uh could people walk in brick and mortar it was just brick and mortar Wow. It was sure. our first store was 200 square feet and we opened it with about $8,000 somehow. Oh, I don't yeah. know how we did that. Yeah, I was looking at photos of the store, the first store the other day and oh, it's embarrassing. It was wow. bad. That's cool though. I mean, you know, to open something up, I mean, 
if I wasn't doing comedy, I'd move to Palm Springs and just open a standard and strange style store out there, you know, with with like a vintage motorcycle and some guitars and audio equipment in there also, you know, just a kind of my bedroom, but uh, shit for sale, you know? <laughs> I think it'd work. I mean, I mean it's, it's the world you inhabit, right? Yeah. Like yeah. our concept for the store, aside from when we first started with, of the Made in America thing, was that Jeremy and I had both had just terrible retail experiences buying clothes over the years. Like I feel men really get the short end of the stick when it comes to this. And so we wanted our store to be just really inclusive and have everyone feel welcome and we'd be friendly. And we had really good product and have even better service. Uh, The service was on real. Let me, let me, let me stress this. I can't stress this enough to anybody listening to this. It was unreal. The one thing you guys didn't have, which I was kind of surprised, is your clothes are very hipster, but there was no hipster snobbery in there. You know, like the old record store vibe when you go in, you got Black Sabbath. (laughs) That's the exact thing we didn't want to do. And that's been like since day one, the rule for everyone we hire to work on the floor and for ourselves. It's like we'd had so many experiences where we'd walk into a denim store or a streetwear store or whatever. And you'd be judged when you walked in, like I'm walking in to spend 300 bucks on jeans to get rid of these garbage jeans I'm wearing. Why are you dogging me right now? Like what's with the mad dog face? Why are you angry that I'm in your store? (laughs) I'm like, I'm shoving $300 at you. That's, and you're mad at me. Most of the time too, it, the owners aren't even there. So it's the employees that are fucking it up for the owners. The owners don't even know that these guys are, are just not even looking at the guy. You go, hey man, uh, what's the difference between uh, a Y2K leather and a real McCoy's? The difference is you don't know. Get out of here. You know, <laughs> and you're like, what? Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm writing that one down. That's pr- I'm going to start <laughs> training my staff to do exactly that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, one of our first kind of requirements when we hire someone is that they have to think about what we do when they're not at work. Yeah. Mm. You know, because Jeremy and I, we're, we're just nerds, really. Yeah. Like, we've never really been cool people, like, growing up. Like, I, instead of going to prom or homecoming in high school, I had LAN parties <laughs> at my house where, like, all my friends would bring over their computers and would connect them and play StarCraft or some bullshit and turn them out and do. We were fucking nerds. <laughs> I mean, what I was into wasn't cool back then. It was, like, I just wanted to, like, listen to my punk rock records and wear my dark denim and my boots and like didn't really care about what was going on but yeah. you know it was like being stuck out of time and so yeah i was sit in my room listen to records read books do my own thing well i find that a lot of people in this show the grail has helped people over the years there's that mentality of like 300 for jeans fuck you because they don't know but if you educate somebody of why they are $300, then they're like, oh, I'm starting to get it. My sweatshop jeans made in you know China that fall apart every eight months. Oh, I bought four pairs of these. I could have bought one of those. Oh, okay. And so if you're mean to them in the store, they're going to be like, fuck that store. I'm going back to Target, you know, or or wherever they go to buy their jeans or their their flannels or their boots. You know, the boots is the the real game changer for me because people will buy these glue on sole junky boots and they fall apart every year and they just do not understand uh, that you can buy one pair of boots. There you go. And just resole it the rest of your life, you know what better thing to have than uh, that old saying, die with your boots on you die with them. And they're like, you've had them for 40 years. That's incredible. You know? I mean, that's, we advocate for our customers in that way in that we fire brands if they don't perform on the quality promise. So we've had brands in the past where it's like, I've had customers be like, you know, I love this brand, but every shirt I buy from them shrinks and doesn't fit me anymore and it shrinks funny and we're like okay that's not good and you know we we always give brands a chance to remediate issues and you're like this brand free note 
has been incredible to work with. They're down in LA. And every time we give them feedback on anything, even the smallest detail, they fix it just like that. Wow. Now, once you get the store going, you're 200 square feet and you start diving in, Neil, you're looking around for brands and stuff. Are you guys online? Because early on my experience, and I talked about it on the show was the first experience really was between New York jean shop and then the LVC stuff coming out which was when they first uh, started coming out. And I wasn't wearing 501s. I was wearing the 517 orange tab. You know, everybody was going for the Black Crow, small boot flare, stoner rock look, you know. And uh, so those were my two introductions. And then, of course, into Self-Edge, finding uh, Ironheart. How do you guys start finding brands? And what was your thing? I had to think back here. I mean, the first batch of brands was just literally people we knew. Red Wing, stuff like that. Yeah. People I'd already interacted with through Taylor Stitch, through all the other brands I'd helped out over the years. It was just people we knew. And then, you know, I'll tell my story and how I how I think about finding brands. And then Neil should talk about how he thinks about it. It's like, I don't look for brands that are commercial. I don't. We don't try to find them at trade shows. It's like... If I see something on Instagram or out in the world that I think looks good, then I'm going to ask, is it good? Where do I get it? Does someone else sell it? Can I have it? And one of the best brands that we sell, I think probably the best denim makers in the world, LA Yofkotin, I've been following them via Super Future since they started. And I never pulled the trigger because I was super nervous about, you know, buying a custom made pair of jeans from Japan back when they're doing custom. Right. But one day I, I saved the, I saved a screenshot of this Instagram. They posted on Instagram and now we were at the point where we could start really buying more stuff. I was like, do you guys wholesale? Just asked a question in a comment thread on Instagram. They DM would me and then we just started ordering from them. And that was kind of, you know, one of the ways we discover we actually got we got we didn't get through to oa just from that instagram comment though uh we uh, yeah. we had some friends who knew them and knew people who worked with them in japan and we ended up getting an introduction to them which is super important uh it goes a long way when you're working with the japanese is if you have someone a trusted source vouch for you and a lot of this was just through our personal networks we had built like we, you know, if we wanted a specific type of thing that we thought our store needed that we didn't have, like a pair of jeans with this fit or this type of fabric or whatever, then if we couldn't find it on our own, we'd start reaching out to other people and, that we knew and they would come and help us. And, but that's just really like starts this long journey where we want to go. And if we can like visit them and meet them in person, because it's this very personal relationship if we're going to do business with someone. Yeah. And then we also want to look at the product and try it on and like, does it pass our muster? Is it what we want? My next uh, introduction to all this was, of course, the early, early inspirations, the ones that were at the Santa Monica airport, uh, that one that was in the airport uh, port hangar. That show, of course, inspirations grew to two different venues. But I think that first couple that I went to that were at the airplane hangar were some of the most organic and coolest shows I've ever been to because it wasn't packed and it was all these Japanese guys and Rin Tanaka had put it all together and it was unreal to me to see these other nerds like me. I went by myself because I didn't want to hear people going, hey, man, let's get the hell out of here. We saw the jeans or, you know, so I was in there. I went both days and was I felt like that, you know, that bumblebee in the uh, blind melon video of like, oh, my <laughs> God, there's other bumblebees out here. Look at us getting crazy, you know. And I remember there was a Japanese mag there. I don't know, like free and whatever that one. Free and easy. Free and easy. And they go, can we get a picture of you? And I was wearing like these West Coast that had a shifter patch that I had custom made with orange stitching. I was wearing a pair of, uh, of, uh, early, uh, iron hearts 
And I had on a, uh, I, I believe it was my D pocket real McCoys, you know, and then, and I was like, I'm in the Dean costume, but I, it was, I love this stuff, you know? And they took a picture of me and I was in a magazine in Japan. I was like, yeah, this is the shit, you know, later it got crazy. That inspiration, you know, it moved to the, the, the one place that was, um, you know, down to uh, the merchandise. Yeah. The merchandise yeah. mart or whatever. Yeah. That place. And I, I didn't care for that layout uh, because the original one, you could just go up and down aisles and you could really see people and, and really hang. The other one was just kind of like, were we down here? I don't know. I mean, it was great, <laughs> but it wasn't like that airplane <laughs> hangar vibe of, and it, and it had that vibe, you know, you're wearing a, you're wearing an A2 and an airplane hanger. And it looked like a secret meeting. It was almost MacGyver, like, check out this denim. And I was really learning about denim companies then, you know, like, what is this stuff right here? You know, were you guys hitting that? Uh, we didn't go to inspiration until 13, 15. maybe 14. Right. Um, we were so laser focused on just getting the store go like between you know, we're working jobs and getting the store going. Like we had no time for outside exploration. We were just like, let's get this thing to work. And, you know, we had no employees and, you know, as things were, we've been able to travel a lot more and do a lot more exploration over time. But those early days were just like head down, you know, I, I'd, I'd go online and look at the pictures from inspiration at night, but I was just like, we just got to like focus, focus, focus. At what point, do you guys take your first trip to Japan and how does this all go down? Do you set up multiple meetings and then you head okay. to Japan? What happens? We, it was 2015 and I had planned to go to Japan just for a vacation that spring, but a bunch of stuff happened that prevented that from going down. So I had these tickets to Japan already for myself. And then it was just like this, bunch of coincidences happened. We got invited to the CC show that Clutch puts on. Oh, yeah. And we had developed this relationship with Oyofkaten. And all of these coincidences piled up to, we should go. It was like this tidal wave of pressure to go. And I went out first to do the family vacation for a couple of weeks. And then we just booked out like, a ton of meetings in so we started with cc show and neil and then, goes too yep. yeah I, yep. I go to yeah. it was a mix of brands that we had already been working with that we wanted to meet in person and also do our buying because it's a buying trip you know you go to a trade show you look at what you want to stock for next season and we had set up some meetings just with brands we didn't work with and weren't even sure if we wanted to work with them or not but we just wanted to meet as many people and learn as much as we could. And so are yeah. you, when you go there, are your minds blown because you're seeing these small little, these small little companies and they're making this stuff and, or, or were you finding out that one company was really secretly making the stuff for multiple boutique companies? What was going on well, there? I mean, you know, I don't think there's ever going to be a trip to Japan that doesn't twist our heads off of learning something new because every time you think you get it, somebody opens a door you know, it's like when you, the Simpsons episode where Bart goes to Mad Magazine is like, it's all boring and someone opens the door and like all everything bursts out. It's it's like that. You're like, oh, I get it. No, you don't. You're never going to get it. <laughs> you know. First trip, I questioned what the hell we were even doing. Like, <sighs> like, w like we're just a bunch of chuckle fucks trying to like cobble something together. And over here in Japan, we have some of the most amazing stores I've ever seen and the most best brands we've ever seen. <laughs> And I spent a day just like feeling bad for myself. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, we should just close. Like we're so bad at this. And then, and then I snapped out of it and was like, wait a minute, <laughs> we can be better. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like let's, let's be as good as these Japanese stores. And I think the thing that really set the tone for our service here was um, when I first got there, I was like, I'm going to go grab a bottle of whiskey to keep the Airbnb. Cause I had rented an Airbnb in Tokyo for a month for this trip. Wow. And I was like, you know, well, let me stock the bar. So I go to the basement at East of 10 where there's this like liquor store with everything. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I just pick a random bottle. And I'm like, I want this one. 
So I bring the bottle to the register and the lady's like, no, 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 that's display. Puts it back in display. And she's like, hold on, goes in back, gets a bottle in a box and I'm waiting for her to hand it to me. And then I leave. No, takes it out of the box, polishes the bottle perfectly, like inspects it, wraps it in tissue paper back in the box, closes the box, tapes the box shut puts the box in a perfect little bag, tapes the bag closed, takes my money, walks around the cash wrap, hands me the bag, and then bows to me. And I'm like, this is where we need to be as a store to be good. Wow. Wow. That's the treatment I got while I was there. I loved it. I was like, wow. And that was, that was a $40 bottle of whiskey or something. Wow. Right? At what point do you guys meet Kento? And the real McCoy squad. That tri- that trip. The first trip. Wow. So how's this go down? Give it to me because this, I mean, I love these guys. Th- this one's totally random and serendipitous. Um, we're at the clutch trade show and, you know, we had, we knew who the real McCoys were and we knew the brand and we had had a few pieces and had a ton of respect for it, but they always had this, um, it always seemed unreachable for us in some way to work with them. Right. They were, they were mysterious in this way. And so we're at the trade show. I run into a buddy of mine who runs a store in Berlin and he says, Hey man, have you seen the real McCoy's The new collections? Really good. I was like, no, I haven't. He's like, well, you stock McCoy's. Yeah. I was like, no, he's like, Oh, come with me. So like, before I know it, like we're like in their booth, which is the biggest booth at the trade show. And we're getting an introduction to them and like, they're really nice. And they, you know, they, we, we tell them who we are and they say, Oh, you know, look around. And it's, it's like really unclear. Like, are they just being polite to us or are they taking us seriously? So we look at the collection and it's huge, first of all, and our minds are just totally blown. I had no idea that they made all of these other different things. I'd only really known them for their leathers and maybe a couple of their jeans. Right. Right. And so we start talking to Kento and he tells us more about all the work and the effort they put into each product. Like, like every, like, like so much of, of what they do is custom just for them. They don't buy anything off the shelf hardly. And so then we like sit down for this meeting and they ask us about, uh, you know, who we are and what we do and, Etc. And we, we, we tell them all about that. And, um, you know, we, we mentioned that we are really good friends and work with this brand, Yucatan, yeah. which Jeremy is very, very close with Yuki then, Matsuda, who runs well, this, this is actually a throwback to the very beginning when I was working for free for everyone is I had done an interview with Yuki in 08 or 09. Um, and that's how I got to know him. And he happened to be showing at the, at, at CC show. So anyways, so, um, it was Kento and his father, uh, Hitoshi, Hitoshi leaves him. once we mention uh, Yuki and then he comes back and he just sort of says like, well, you know, we've, we're not really looking for more wholesale accounts. We're actually trying to focus more on McCoy's standalone stores in Japan. And I'm like getting ready for this, like, okay, like, no, okay, fine. You know, well, and he says, but if you make a, an order that is uh, not bigger than this very small number, we can, and you don't sell online, we can work with you. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, what? I've never had a maximum order amount. <laughs> it's always a minimum and so i like kind of do some quick math i was like ah yeah i think we can do like a, a we can bring in a line that's representative of what you know within this budget they gave us wow and um which is like it was like so strange you know i think they're just they're just testing us right yeah yeah really what they're trying to do and so we place an order it comes and then you know i ask them like hey you know I'd like to restock things and this and that. And then they're like, Oh, Oh, you can order whatever you want now. Wow. <laughs> wow. And then, so then my first restock order was like four times as big as my first order. <laughs> and and it, it, we, you know, it was a very slow process for them too. Cause we weren't even allowed to sell online. Yeah. Now why is that? Because they have their stores, right? I think it's, it's because they're, they're very, they want their brand to be shown in the right way right right like they wanted to be presented in the best way possible 
And, um, but also like, there's such an old school brand too, that like, they want people to not just buy their clothes online. They want them to come into a store and try it on and touch it and feel it and get the service from the staff there. Cause that's the best way to do it. If you can, of course. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's the one, when they had the booth set up at inspiration, it was the biggest booth, of course. And it was in the best spot, right. When you walk in and I think that they, could see the explosion my brain was doing as I was looking at each one of their jackets and finally finding the Holy grail of leather jackets to me. I was like, I can't even believe what I'm seeing right now because I grew up looking for the ultimate Buco D pocket. And of course they were always dry rot or square bodied or the wrong size. And back then I was fat. So it was hard to find a, a buco that was 44, or like really hard. And um, so to see the work that they did and also the key thing with them is like Led Zeppelin, man, they had this mystique. You were just like, who are these guys? I mean, you know, Kento's dead, you know, he's got the easy rider, Peter Fonda, chopper he rode across america and <laughs> you know this kind of stuff you're like these guys are badass you know and their stores in japan are insane and they, and they had the one you know in new york before the flood or whatever happened to them but it was just mind-boggling stuff and from then on i was obsessed with uh, with the japanese culture and the clothing and everything you know just from from kento really and he was just such a great dude yeah, Kento's amazing. He is, yeah. man. He yeah, is. Like, I, I tried to get him on the podcast like 10 <laughs> times. He's all, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's his, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's his way of like, no. <laughs> He's well, pretty shy, you know? Well, Kento, it's like, we're like, hey, we want to go see a thing. Like, we want to go to Shinky and see how leather is made, how horse how horse hide. And, and the next trip, he's like, we're going to Shinky. Well, what and was it, that like? Oh my God, that was like stepping back in time. Yeah. Wow. A few near death experiences. Uh, I almost fell in the tanning pits. <laughs> wow. Really? I went up there to take some photos of the tannery. Um, and it's like, you know, you're going back in time, both in like how they make leather, but also a little bit of industrial safety going on there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And so there's like these like metal catwalks that go above these big tanning pits where like the leather is sitting in this tanning liquor for six months or longer. Right. And I'm like trying to get the, like the right angle and I'm all bent over and at this weird thing and, and it's wet and my foot slips <laughs> well, <laughs> and like, and, and, and I, I start to go down, but I catch myself, but I, my foot fell in the tanning pit. <laughs> oh. And there was another, I have a shot of you standing on like a rotting two by four shooting down into the pits too like there's this like maybe it's like a four by six or something it's like the tiniest board bending under neil's weight as he's like trying to get the shot yeah and you, gotta, like, you gotta get the shot you gotta you gotta take risk to get the yeah, shot yeah oh yeah but i mean plenty of people have died for the shot <laughs> well, i'm not it's, passing them <laughs> it's incredible though it's like we're just like seeing all these horse hides being processed and he take and the owner takes us through every single step he's like here's the tanning pit here's the big drums where they do their thing get tumbled and you know for the shell for the shells for shell cordovan they get glazed it's called glazing because there's this big glass thing on a mechanical pusher and the glass glazes the shell cordovan by crushing it's, it in there like so you like run it through this little machine wow. it's like a mechanical rolling pin that's glass yeah. And the thing it's like amazing. it it's terrifying because it's moves really fast and you kind of it's like this rolling pin that's like running on its own and you gotta take this big piece of shell cord of it and kind of like feed it into it and move it around to, so that uh, it polishes it. Yeah. And I went then, to Horwain, man. It's it's unreal uh to see these old world processes of of shell cordovan and they're in these like hot tubs you know the long yep. big old bays of like of 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 conditioners and acids and everything you're like and and it's four stories in in chicago and you're like what the? this is insane it's insane yeah. to see that stuff 
That's only Shinky is like every time we thought we were done, no, there's another floor, there's another room. We go around one corner and it's like hanging shells, pieces of shell cordovan as far as you can see down this warehouse. And those guys crank shell cordovan because they use it all, almost all of it goes to making Japanese school kid backpacks. Wow. Because you get this backpack when you're like in kindergarten and you have it until you're in high school and they're like a thousand dollars for the good ones. Wow. And the good ones are all shell cordovan. And because of this, they showed us every color you can imagine, like emerald green, scarlet, all, all shell. Yeah, it's just like wow. crazy. Wow. Um, and then we're like, Kento, I want to see a loop wheel place. He was like, okay. So next time we go, he's like, we're going to go to uh, one of the two. You know, there's only two loop wheel factories in Japan. He's like, I'll take you to mine, uh, the one they work with. And we get in the van, you know. A lot, a lot of our life doing this business is just get in the van. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah don't yeah. ask questions. So get in much the van. of this travel is just moving. Yeah. Just moving. Yeah, like, don't yeah. ask questions. Get in the van every time. And so we drive for like an hour down the coast to this beautiful town in the bay and go into, they, they had to move the plant because the, what, the old one washed away in a typhoon or flooded in a typhoon. Uh, but they, were, they saved all the machines. We go in there. And I've been in, I don't even know how many factories at this point, mills. What's crazy about the loop wheel place is it's almost silent because they're oh. so slow. They just wow. turn so slow and they're so chill, you know, as opposed to like, you go to a modern knitting mill and it's just, well, it's like chaotic. They're just like yeah. blasting fabric. And these loop wheelers are just like hanging out, being chill, making their one meter per hour or whatever. Wow. It's uh, it's a relaxing mill. Were you able to see where they uh, make those leather jackets, like the D pockets mm -hmm. and stuff? Well, what was that like? They That's do all those story. in house. In house at, at the McCoy's headquarters in Kobe. So we've toured there. You know, every trip to Japan, we go and we see McCoy's. We go out of our way because we want to to go to go to Kobe. And how many and guys are making those jackets? Is it like six? Eight, six to eight, I would say. Last time I was there. And wow. what they do is they take this really like long-term vision to this where all the guys that were sewing the jackets were pretty young. And so they would, some of them were people that they had hired who worked for them at their stores. So they were guys who like, were like you, Dean, they like loved leather jackets. That was their favorite things. What they were just, what they thought about day and night. And so they trained them on how to make them. And whereas if you go to a lot of other sewing factories, most of the labor force is pretty old. And right, right, the first right. thing I'm thinking is like, okay, what happens in 10 years when they retire? Right, right. That's you know, what you, I always think about a lot of that, you know, like, hey, it's like when Brian the bootmaker was around, I was like, you know, there's no young cobblers, you know, so when these cobblers are gone, you know, the, the old world kick ass uh you know resewing and the craftsmanship and all that stuff would be gone yeah so train young guys and they're going to be in there for 40 years yeah and so all their jackets there are made atelier style where one person makes it from start to finish wow instead of like more production line style like like say with jeans or something else where like one person sews on the sleeves and another person does another operation right and so it's much more expensive and slower if you do this, you know, one person makes one jacket, but it requires you to have you to be really good at all of the skills required required to make a leather jacket. Uh, well, you know, that's crazy uh, and, about that. It's like the Fender Custom Shop. Now you get into the nerding of yeah. which guy's the best. You know, oh, you want, you know, J7 or whatever his code is, you know, uh, he he I gives you he gives you a little more armhole room, you know, or whatever. But but that's where the the Japanese consistency and craft kicks in cuz they're all the best. Yeah. Yeah. It you know, true. there's no there's no room for oh there's a little extra like every single one is going to be the same like well, I mean it's still leather but Right. right. The craftsmanship on every single one is going to be the best or that jacket's not going to leave. 
And the other thing is, you know, it's not just this atelier construction. It goes back to that tannery. Like the McCoy's supply chain goes all the way back. They have their own hides. And it's like Kento was showing me a hide. And he's like, well, this one, we're going to cut this scar out because that'll fail in 10 years. And then what you want to do is you want to make, and I don't remember which piece is which here, but he was like, so this is like the neck area of the horse. And we're going to put that here on your elbow. So it's got more stretch because there's more stretch in the horse's neck. Wow. And every cut, every piece is thought out. It's not the most efficient way to use a hide at all. Yeah. But it makes, you make these decisions now that jacket exists in 30 or 40 years. Like he really is making like future vintage. Right. And mo- if the trim isn't old dead stock, the McCoy's, McCoy's made it. They do all this stuff no one else is willing to do to make these jackets. Like the A2 thread story. Um, I wasn't there for this, yeah. but I'll tell it. So one of the things that really blew my mind about how far the real McCoys are willing to go to get exactly what they want is when they were developing their A2 leather jacket, which is, I think it's their most, it's, this is the jacket that they are the most known for. It is right. like their flagship jacket. Right. And when they were doing their development, you know, the, the, like they have these vintage jackets and they're making their samples based on that. Right. And, you know, when you do this, like you go and you buy leather and you buy thread and you buy this and that when you're doing your development, uh, just from like off the shelf stuff. And the thread that was available off the shelf was not this right size or like fabric composition as the original jackets. And they didn't like the way this thread sewed up in a jacket. They didn't like the way it aged or wore, you know, and looked in a year or two. So they went and they had their own thread made in in the right color, in the right size, and 100% cotton instead of having a poly blend. It's like when they were doing their development, they were, we want to get every single little detail right, and we are going to make our own thread to get this jacket right. Wow. Which blew my mind because when you make thread, it's not like you buy one or two spools. You have to buy a lot of right, thread. Right, right, right. Whose obsession is it? Is it Kento's dad who goes all the way both. to this? Wem- both this? of them. Both of them. Yeah. I think it's really and, everyone. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's the whole team. Nobody there is not obsessed. Yeah. You know, they are all psychopaths about what they're doing. You know, their pattern maker, all of them are so intense about this craft. And Kento is like what's inside of Kento's head is unbelievable because he is running this deep knowledge, not just on a leather jacket on, but on every single style, like that frog skin or the uh, tiger camo piece you picked up from us. Love it. Like, so the fabric on that, he was explaining to me is like, they want that fabric to look and feel as shitty as the original. Cause that was like war, you know, Vietnam war era fabric. It was not good. Right. So he wants the best fabric but he wants to be slubby and shitty looking like the original. Yeah. He's like trying to split this impossible like concept. And then they don't have a printer wide enough. So they hand screen the thing in two passes. It's, it's insane. And that's just one jacket. And then like the little beads on there, are like sourced from some Island and I, you know, off the coast of Japan, it's all just like, yeah, I, I can't even, really wrap my head around the intensity and you know if they can't get something right they just won't make it like we couldn't get our favorite chinos and i know this sounds dumb favorite chinos you're like you know go get your blue shirt and go back to casual fridays but the blue seal chinos from mccoy's are just they've been our top selling chinos forever because they're perfect in every way and they couldn't get the fabric right or something like something went wrong in supply chains so like we'll just not make them until we could fix this one thing Wow. Wow. Now behind you, Jeremy is some of the McCoy's jackets. Can you show us uh let's show them an oh, A2. Uh, a quick, an A2. Was, that was that orange, the new orange cloth one I almost bought. Oh, the Canyon yeah. red one. Yeah. Give me a minute here. I gotta I gotta take it out of its uh yeah, yeah. I can, special. I can I can smell it. I can smell it. <laughs> yeah, this is actually like how I get started in the morning. I don't drink coffee, I just grab an A2 and I smell it. Yeah, that would get me gone. 
I think if I didn't do comedy, actually, I'd move to Japan and work at Real McCoy's. <laughs> Look at so, that. Look yeah, at like that. in this one, you know, it's like they, I think this is a different brown on the cuffs. Right. And, you know, you can, it's hard to see on Zoom, but. Yeah, yeah, but still. Um, this one has a different silk liner, different wow. color. Wow. It's, yeah, they, and they, God, they I can't special... describe the hand feel of this thing. It's just like. Yeah. Yeah, this is the one. Oh, this is the Yume. Oh, no. Th- there's a story behind this jacket. Yeah. This one is even like the Canyon Red is interesting. This yeah. one, this guy is $4,000. So let's wait for someone to write in and complain. Oh, yeah. Like you're saying, Dean. $4,000. You're fucking idiot, okay. man. So I will tell this story because <laughs> let me just rack this real quick and then yeah. I'll talk yeah. about it because i need to be sitting down yeah. for the amount of energy this story contains <laughs> so kanto pulls this out when yeah. we're looking through the collection and i'm like it's a four thousand dollar a2 and he's like hold on so there's a guy in kyoto who's a living national treasure i think that's the the name that japan gives these people he dyes things red that's all he does and Co- um, Kyoto is known for being really good at dyeing things red. Hermes dyes things there. Wow. Because the water in that river that goes through Kobe is perfect for fixing red dye. And there's one guy there who specializes in this one very specific kind of dyeing things red. And it's almost impossible to get to work with him. McCoy's was able to get him to do these jackets so they take their horse hide and then he dyes them red by hand it's well, tell, tell them about the um because the yume korozen is in feudal japan was a color of the gods yeah and only the emperor was allowed to wear this specific shade of red wow and if you were not the emperor and you wore it they would kill you oh off with your yeah. head i love yeah, it yeah it's and and so he's like he's like a a master dyer who will sort of keep these old dying traditions alive. And he's paid by the government. He's basically on like a lifetime fellowship from the government in a way. Wow. And so this Yume Korozen is that emperor's color. That's and insane. Yeah. Yeah. And, but the color is such a trip because, you know, if it's, if it's in like dim light or, or the shade, it looks kind of brownish green. Right. But then once it hits sunlight or any light reflects off of it, it turns this bright red color. Wow. I don't know. It's, it's really hard to get the effect. Right, right, and right. Like right. I th- we took it outside in Yokohama when we saw it because the show, the trade shows at Yokohama to really yeah. see the color. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, they only made, God. They didn't make very many of it. It was a super like limited 20? run. That makes yeah, how many they made, but that it, makes me it, want to have it. You know what I mean? I think it's like I think we were allowed to buy four. I, that that's like Pulp Fiction. Oh, this jacket. You see this jacket? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's like I, it. It has such a great story that you're dying to tell it at a party. People are like, "What's with that jacket?" Oh, this jacket. This was made by the guy that dyes the emperor's clothing. <laughs> yeah, it's uh Yeah, it's like he basically he studies he studied his entire life on how to dye colors like this. God, that is I mean there you that go. Back sh- in the bag. That and kind of bag shit with you. is great. I mean it was it was just an example of this level of technical skill, but also history and yeah. respect that they have for the oh. whole process. <laughs> Here's the king. And something that was so rare and so special, like it's truly a piece of art. There it is, right there. There's the candy yeah. red. So this is a, this one's a bargain. I love that this one. jacket. I almost left with this, but I went. So there's the to yeah. This is a replication, a replica of a fucked up production process during World War II, where the cuffs came out the wrong damn color. That's great. And they just I, like faded to this stupid red, and. Oh. It's it looks so good with the oh with the seal brown oh dude and you can and here you can see this is the regular McCoy's liner oh, not the silk that's in it. the right in the Yume yeah but you know this is still like an insanely high quality rayon they make themselves oh just for their A twos oh my god 
Now, is that the size 38, man? The 38 fit, fit me like a glove. That is the 38, yes, oh, right here. I'm holding it. It's your that's, jacket, Dean. That's the Dean okay. jacket, man. Oh, God. That <laughs> thing fit me so good. Right here. Now, Look, come on. now you point it after Jeremy's touched it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm over here smelling it. Don't mind me. Let's get a little bit into some of the uh, other brands you carry there. Uh, we could talk hours on McCoy's. They yeah. are the gods, well, but let's get into some of the stuff. Uh, so I, once you, you've locked down McCoy's and a few other brands, then you start going to what Japan once a year and find another twice. brand two to three times a year. A year yeah. Time. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, we've actually stopped aggressively pursuing other brands. Now it's like, we have everything, almost everything we want. Occasionally a new brand will pop up like fountainhead leathers, just like two guys approached us in Japan. They're like, Hey man, we make leather jackets. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. And they show us their jackets. I showed you their jackets. They're right. incredible. Right. Um, you know, and yeah, we go a couple times a year. A lot of what we do is just maintaining those relationships we already have. It's incredibly important to be there face to face to share meals, um, you know, drink 12 highballs with uh, Canto, that kind of thing. <laughs> what is the history of Y2K leathers? Now, I got the Y2? green. Yeah, I got the green what? Carco back there. What are they about? They are pri they primarily do private label for other people, and that's what they've been doing for a long time. And then I don't know when they launched their own customer facing brand, but we found them last year. We found them a while back. It just took some time with COVID and everything to really kick off ordering with them because we they're one of the only brands that we haven't met before ordering. Wow, due to wow. due to COVID, right? But, they had such a good reputation that we just went uh, for it. Why, why to, they've been making leather jackets for over 40 years. Wow. Really? And yeah. And they work with a lot of leather tanneries very closely and they have a lot of custom leathers that are developed by them and that are really unique and really special. Like that olive horse hide you have. Unreal. Uh, and so, so, so they have like this long history of expertise in making leather jackets and just working with leather and leather goods. And so yeah. now they have their own, their own brand. Um, and they just do some of the coolest stuff like that jacket you bought. That horse hide is extra thick because they take a 1.6 millimeter thick horse hide, which is already borderline too thick for a leather jacket. Right. And then they shrink it to make it heavier, kind of like unsamphorized denim. Yeah. But that, but, but that shrinking process makes it like tougher and stiffer than if you were to go start with yeah. regular unshrunken leather that was thicker. Right. Ah, uh, yeah. I this saw guy that, here, I, I look saw how that, stiff this is. I, whoop, whoop. <laughs> I saw that jacket and I already knew it was going to be a fucking pain in the ass to break in. But it was so unique and radical that I was like, I am not leaving without this. It took two guys to button it. It took yep. both of you guys to button it. <laughs> Look at this so, jacket. Now, is that blue? This is indigo. When we're when Neil was talking about how they how they're able to do things with the tanneries, no one else can. Yeah. This goes the opposite direction. This is an indigo horse hide that's like butter. Like oh. it's just I love it's it. so soft. And it's in, it's real indigo too. It's not dyed indigo blue. It's dyed with indigo and super hard to do to leather. And they did it. So that's why I pulled this one out to yeah. go with Neil's explanation of their close relationships with tanneries. Yeah, like why too? They take more creative liberties, right? You know, and they make stuff that like maybe could have existed, you know, back in the day, but probably didn't. Right, right. It's not like an exact McCoy's replica. Or, yeah, McCoys do more of the straight reproduction things where they right, take right. something that existed that they and just make it in the bet to the best of their ability. Right. And now then, what do we got there? This is the fountainhead one I was oh, showing yeah. you last oh, time. I tried and this it on. is it was a, fantastic. It's a burgundy deep pocket. And you know, it's got it's not a specific repro. Fountainhead makes what they think is the best concept of a of a concept so this is like their idea of a deep pocket like right. what would make a deep pocket incredible not what deep pockets existed so you know it's got you know the stud on the applet and then but it also has you know these little jams here yeah 
I love it that. mashes it's up studs, the studs on the sleeves. I love it. You know, it's got the pigeon eyes at the bottom yeah. of the zipper. I love that, that old detail here. Yeah. And it's, you know, but it doesn't have a gusted back. Yeah. And this isn't any one D pocket, but they do it. They, you know, usually when you mash up a bunch of influences, you get trash. You're like, right. why did you guys like do all of this? Now you've made a horrible monstrosity. But they pull it all together into a, like a super elegant, like this could have existed. Well, that's the dream, you know, over the years when you wear jackets, you know, the fail spots, you know, the, um, the things you don't like about it, like a big barely upper arm area, you know, I don't want it to be like a big football area there. I don't want the D pocket to be. Uh, too thick to where it rips off of the jacket because it's it it's too thick on top of the other thick leather. You know, uh, I don't like gussets because I have wide shoulders and they blow open. If you look at every vintage buco, the gussets are blown open permanently and it looks terrible to me. Uh, I also yeah. like a removable belt because uh, they they smash into things and and wreck stuff. And it's just multiple over the years. I like top zipper. So when you're riding, you can roll your arm back while you're riding. Uh, th there's just all these great things you learn over the years. And if you can put it together like they did, like this is a dream D pocket jacket. And then you go like, oh, man, they 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 fixed everything. And it still looks cool vintage. You know, let's talk about what you carry real quick. You carry boots, jackets, denim. And uh, kind of uh, knits. knits, a lot of loose wheel, a lot of, of loose wheel shirts, hoodies, sweatpants, yeah. a lot of trousers. We have, you know, we still have a really strong game in khakis and chinos that are not boring ass dockers. We've got, we have a lot of categories that you know we carry because people do other stuff than dress rock and roll. And right, so we've got like blazers, we've got a brand from China that's incredible called motive from china yeah so this guy samuel he owns a store actually it's a bunch of stores now i met him when it was a store he sells mccoy's he sells Kborn. his store is called radiance and he's got now radiance blue and now it's a bunch of other stores but he started making um his own line probably two years ago called motive and he's working with it was it was three or four years was ago. it I've lost track of all time after COVID. I'm of course, like, yeah. that was yesterday. Um, and so there's all this technical expertise in Beijing and Shanghai from all the British tailors that have ever been there from all the colonial years. And so he's got this guy, I forget his, his powder maker's name. It was a trained tailor. And they've got all these vintage, like German and British workwear patterns. Wow. And they're, and they've got, like these little ateliers sewing their stuff around Beijing and Shanghai and turning out insanely high quality, really well fitted, like incredible garments across the spectrum. It's hard to buy from them because they make so much good stuff. The way I describe motive is they, Ow. they do a mix of like, they like do a lot of remixing of military repro, but they don't do the standard British or American repro that you find. Wow. They'll do like Scandinavian or some of the more like rare military pieces that you don't really ever see. Oh, I love that. And yeah. oh. they mix that with just some of the best tailoring and fitting I've ever seen. And like the most beautiful construction on the inside of a, of a piece. And then wow. they have all their fabrics custom made for them from the best mills in the world. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Their, their custom it's... fabric theme is insane. Wait, also, is this that... is. Is that who makes that green shirt I got on order? That's number. I, I need a number two or whatever. That military kind of. It looks like this. no, okay. no. That's Oris Lowe from Japan. Oh, so I'm wearing. Okay. This is a motive linen tee, which wow. is incredibly hard to make. To make a t-shirt out of 100% linen. Wow. But like this is one thing they make. It's a chore coat in a scarlet linen from from England, wow. and it's just like the tailoring on it. When you put it on, it just fits perfectly. It's an incredible piece. It's um, I don't remember which mill made it, but it's like a cotton linen blend. And it's just it's linen and wool. Linen wool, right? <laughs> wow, that is so and cool. And it's like 
like yeah. just like the way the the seams are set in i you know it's one of those things you have to handle to understand right right and right. then on the other end of the spectrum is this wild ass corduroy jacket we got from them over winter and the lining on this is i don't know if you, you probably see how well you can see it oh i can see it yeah look at like, that and you look can see that. like the little quilted detailing like these guys are not playing around wow and, and that's china yeah. man like wow look at that and then like the sleeves are quilted and it's got a storm cuff hidden in here wow and it's... yeah it's incredible workmanship it's like you know these guys have been you know china's been making incredible garments for you know thousands of years right and then you tack that on to being trained in tailoring by the british and everyone over the years you just get this you know con that comes together with motive into you know something that at first you're like how does that fit in with like the leathers and the boots but when you see it in person it all makes sense dean our store concept is americana remixed around the world yeah so we've got like the japanese various Japanese interpretations of that. We've got stuff We got this brand Indigo Farah from Sweden, which, you know, I, I like to play this exercise with my staff. It's like, okay, if this brand was a movie, what would the movie be about? Who would star in it? Like really get into the, like build this story around like what this brand would be if yeah. it came alive. Yeah. And Indigo Farah would be like a bunch of Vikings that moved to like, Arizona in the middle of nowhere and like started this motorcycle gang. And they were like in this, um, like, like the evil landlord wanted to like kick them off their land where their club was. And so like, they got into this, like, you know, fight, fight with the landlord. <laughs> I love the description. Yeah. So, so we've got like, like, you know, the Swedish perspective of like that. And then we've got like motive, you know, yeah. where they really take a lot of these other different parts of sort of Western clothing and remix them all together. And this other brand called first pattern from Italy. Oh God. Yeah. They, first pattern is fucking incredible. They take, so, they take a mix of like Ivy league trad, like fifties American style, and then mix it with Italian workwear or sprezzatura. Wow. Like Chris is a lunatic genius. Like he's got that McCoy's mentality of he is willing to do stuff. No one else is willing to do. Like he's like, well, I want, this specific um, knit herringbone, usually a herringbone is a woven, right? He makes these knit blazers. You put them on, it's like a sweatshirt. Wow. And it's like a blazer, would, but like a hoodie feel. Yeah. I never thought I'd be a blazer guy. I wear one of his blazers probably three days a week because I'm like, I'm not going to wear a hoodie when I can wear this thing. <laughs> right, 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 right. Then, so yeah, it, you know, we're a lot more expansive than just, um, you know, just cc show as a concept it's like we are we have a huge dynamic range of what we do at what point uh, does the show does the shop start to really take off and you move to your location now i mean was it just did it hit 20, in like right away 2015 wow. 2015 it was one of those we're also like we make our own luck kind of you know, we see opportunities and we judge them. And, if, you know, we think on our feet and the space we're in now that you came to used to be a yarn store. And we had originally wanted to be next door to this in another space, but it was too expensive back when we got the spot in the alley. And I saw the yarn store put up a sign saying going out of business. I called our landlord that same day. I was like, okay, what's going on? Yeah. And I was like, Neil, check this out. So we go in, we're like, shit, I don't know if we can afford the rent on this. And then we're like, well, if we do this, we're right next to the right next door to the best restaurant in town. We have real foot traffic. And we looked at our sales numbers. We're like, we can just squeak by. You know, we're not paying ourselves again, but we can do it. And that this move into here, this space right now, it's just like that straight up from there. Wow. Now, do you also think that the the influx of massive money with the, the uh, tech world also helped your business because all of a sudden all these people had all this money to buy stuff around the Bay area. You know, a lot of our growth was online after we, so the in-store business has been jeans and sweatshirts primarily. 
It's and boots, boots and boots. I mean, we we, we sell boots. actually a little bit of everything in store. I mean, Dean, I would say like, yeah, having a lot of people with more disposable income, like, of course it definitely helps, but right. on like right around the time we moved into our current store in 2015 is when we hired a couple more people and we were able to really put in the effort to do an online store. Cause it's just as much work as another business. Oh God. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's what you, and good thing you were doing that because during COVID then you just switched into an online store, obviously. Yeah. So if you didn't have that, that footprint out there, you would have sank, you would have been done. Yeah. We would have yeah. been done. We would have closed because starting to get from zero to online is such a big lift even with all the tools now to really do it well, it's like all, you know, like Shopify, all of that, all that has done is made the first step easier. It hasn't made the grind any different. Right. Right. Cause that's what I used to do is build e-commerce sites before Shopify. Wow. And it used to be just to get an e-commerce site going before Shopify was a nightmare. But now it's like that goal, you know, that line moved and now it's easy, but it's still, it's not like open site, make money. It's, there's so much more. Yeah. It's like, you, you don't just like rent a storefront and then like open it up. Right. You got to build fixtures. You got to do all the work. You got to fill it with product. You've got to train your staff on how to sell it. You've got to, you know, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. It, and it's a totally living. different game. Also, the people have to be educated on what you're selling. So there's that slow ride of that. And thank God for the internet, because the people go down deep dive rabbit holes like myself at night when you're sitting around bored and you're like, whoa, look at this. Why 2K leather? What is this? And then all of a sudden you're just all over it and you're like, where can I find it? Oh, this shop has it. So thank God for the internet in that way, man, it really educates yeah. you, you know? It still does like require a lot of service from our end too, you know, where like when we went online only during COVID, it was it was like more work in some ways for us because, you know, if someone wants to buy a thousand dollar pair of boots from us or a two thousand dollar leather jacket, we would probably spend an hour or two with them in the store. Yeah. You know, really going over it, doing a proper fitting, talking to them about it, really educating them. And it just goes a lot slower online. You oh, like, yeah. A lot of, yeah. Right. Back a lot of emails. Forth. The back and forth yeah. is crazy. Well, oh, is it is it wide there or this here or this this? You know, and yeah, you know, I mean, there's nothing better than brick and mortar to me. So I was in your shop for like four hours, and it was like <laughs> I would I'd be there on the weekends if I lived in the neighborhood, just hanging out. And uh, you know, I'm the type of guy. I'm, I'm like the uh, the the side man. People go, "What about this?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, I got two of those." You know what I mean? <laughs> And shit just yeah, please moves. come. We'll fly you up then. Just come yeah. hang out the weekend. Shit just moves, man. When there's a proper guy in there, other than the two guys that are in there, because then it's a third. It's a third opinion, you know. Yeah, I and mean, we got, it, yeah, it, we got it, customers it, like that who come and hang out, and they're you know they're wingman. Oh yeah. Here. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, your shop is like a Harley shop where people go on the weekends, you know, get away from their wife and hang out and be like, you know, I was really thinking about an A2. I was never an A2 guy, but I don't know, maybe an A2. And then they talk to you about A2s for like six weeks. You know? And then you sell them a sportster and yeah. everyone makes fun of them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Now, uh, let's get into a little bit about now. Do you have a shop in Santa Fe? Yes, we yep. opened our Santa Fe store two and a half That's years the one, ago. Wow. Uh, it's fall, it's fall nineteen. Ago. Yeah, it was the one that caused COVID. Wow. <laughs> now, what's that store like? Is it like this one exact? It's different. Yeah. It's it's same but different. Um, Santa Fe is where we get kind of weird. Yeah. Like 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 in Oakland. Um, it's it's a different approach, uh, which is more tailored towards you know what's what's the taste of like Bay Area style yeah. and Bay Area style is uh, I will diplomatically say has its limits. Well, it's very conservative in the clothing, other than certain neighborhoods or certain groups of people. That I would say eighty percent of the Bay Area. I used to call them just cotton dockers. You know, they were just give me outfit yeah. number fourteen. Thank you. That that the cotton docker outfit is now 
a pair of slim selvage jeans yeah. from like Gustin or Taylor Stitch, like whatever the hundred and twenty dollar pair, cheapest pair of slim selvage jeans you can find. Yeah, a hoodie and a nice T-shirt. That's the new do- That's the new blue shirt in Dockers uniform. Yeah. yeah, you know, and it's like either Vans or Red Wings or like some direct consumer. Uh, we solved the problem of shoes with the internet shoes on the feet, right? Yeah. But I love those guys because they come in and we can educate them. They already get the concept. And we're like, well, that hoodie's okay, but check out this. Put on this loop wheel hoodie. And then yeah. their mind explodes. Absolutely. So in Santa Fe, you can get out there. Like, can you get into like the turquoise rings? And, the, you know, because when you're in Japan, you'll go into a store and it'll be like, oh, my God, this is all like hippie Zeppelin kind of clothing with like feather beads and weird blankets and all that stuff. They have all these theme stores in Japan. Yeah. Our Santa Fe store, we have some vintage uh, native jewelry there. Uh, but where we get more weird is where, cause we've been a capital dealer for geez, probably seven years and we never get that weird with capital in Oakland. Cause just people just don't get it. Right. Just, they don't bond with it. Right. But in Santa Fe, there's a totally different level of taste and sophistication when it comes to clothing and they are willing to get weird and it's yeah. really exciting and it's fun because the stuff that like we really like and appreciate, but it's just like too out there for like, like what? Like the capital makes this uh, vest that's made out of this nylon print fabric. That's got a, it's got a bandana print. Oh yeah. And, but they cut it into tubes and put, um, you know, like batting insulation in it. And then they, you have all, they make all these strips out of it and then they like weave the vest out of these. So it looks, it looks like a puffer vest, right. like, but then you pick it up and you're like, what the shit did they do to this thing? Because <laughs> it's first they make the tubes and then they hand weave the tubes into, into the body of the vest and they sew that whole thing together. It is a truly mental garment, like yeah. something, you know, Nobody would think to do this, to translate like the puffer vest into this wild work of art. Some Dennis Hopper stuff, man. I I always love Dennis Hopper's kind of Santa Fe mind and everything as photography and as uh, the architecture out there, of course, and uh, and everything matching and just it's just beautiful out there. And then the, the vibe of the people, it's a very, very big art community, you know, and mm-hmm. people are definitely want to look different and be outside the box. Well, it's like the second largest art market in the country after New York. Wow. Wow. Cause everyone from New York goes there. Everyone from California goes there. Everyone has their third or fourth or fifth home there. You know, if you're, if you're one of those many house guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. That and Talus, you know, you got that big money rolling around out there, and but they have taste. That's the the key there. Big money, but taste. You know, have you guys ever ventured into some eyewear? I'm um, uh, addicted to eyewear. Jacques Marie Maj, Blake Kuahara, and Kubaram. Some incredible eyewear. Have you ever thought about doing eyewear in your shops? We've talked about it, but it's. It's such a challenge. So like Santa Fe is right next to the best optical shop in town. So it would oh, make yeah. sense there. And right, right. Oakland, it's like, where are we going to put it? And something we keep talking about, but it's a really hard category to crack. So we're not going to do something unless we can do it really well. Right. And to do it really well is to be an eyewear store. Yeah. So I don't want to yeah. just buy like two Japanese brands and put them in the corner and be like, we do eyewear. Yeah, you know, I'd want to have like, what are the top three Japanese eyewear brands? What are the top three European ones? Who matters? You know, and what is representative for us? Yeah. Also, like, I, I'm not an eyewear guy. Right. Um, I so don't have, don't know I'm, I'm not, yeah. I don't know it. And if we're going to bring in a new category of product, like we need to be citizens of, citizens of that world. I need to be super into it. Right. To, to be able to do it well. And I'm just not. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm wearing a pair of glasses. They're made by, uh, these are sure on one it. of the old, yep. Yeah, oldest, you know, them and Mosca, they're like the oldest gla- remaining American glasses makers. And it's like, these haven't changed. This 
pair hasn't changed in 50, 60, I don't even know, 70 years. Yeah. And I've had them for a decade and I've had them relensed twice. And then my other pair is from Curry and Paxton in the UK. They're, they're the guys who made all of Michael Caine's glasses for like all his movies. Yeah. But beyond that, it's like, I know what I like, but I don't have enough bandwidth to like really dive into this expansive world. There's, there's companies and guys that are the level of Kento and the real McCoys in the eye, uh, mm-hmm. eyeglass world. Now, uh, like this one here is a frame inside a frame, you know? Whoa. It, Damn. Yeah. So it's, if you look at it, it's just, you know, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's like all glitching out from the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like a goggle though. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty sick though. Yeah. I like it. So, I mean, Jacques Marie Maj, uh, the level he, it takes 18 months to make a frame and, and to yeah. see the process of how they do it in Japan. I mean, he goes to the oldest acetate museum on the planet and finds old colors and, 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 and Blake Kuahara figured out how to put a frame in a frame without it bleeding, you know, the bleeds of the two frames. These guys are, are another level. So that's, yeah, it, it, I get that's it. out there. It is. And it is. there's a brand I'm super into called regards R I G A R D S. Right. And I got into them through, I think through motive there. Who sell, I think they sell, um, I think Samuel sells them at radiance, but their shit is wild. And they do a lot of very esoteric collaborations. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, uh, it's definitely a world that uh, you have to know in. But the good thing about uh, Jacques Marie Maj or Blake Kuahara is they're limited. So they're gone. So if you just had like 10 of their pieces, people would be like, oh my God, they've got them here, you know, and then they're gone. And, you know, on the secondary market, they go for like $400 more or whatever. So you've always got this kind of cool. Uh, rabid following on eyewear, which is pretty crazy. But yeah, I get it. You start to get into too many things and then it blurs the vision of the uh, store. Your store like, already made my head fall off, you know? Yeah, it's like we, we've we talked about doing timepieces, but it's like, how do we, how do you do that without being a watch dealer, right? Right, right. It, well, it's if you so specialize, hard. like I only handle Tudor. Tutors killing yeah. it right now. And you go, yeah, we've got five tutors. We carry the black Bay line. And then it's like, Oh, yeah. okay. But we'd have to be like, well, we want, what is like the real McCoy's of watches. And then we wind up down a rabbit hole that you never come back from, you know? Oh yeah. yeah. And it's oh, like, yeah. Yeah. you know, we're, and we're still exploring where the limits are on some of the kinds of things that we sell. It's like, you know, there's so much more in footwear and, denim and leather jackets to like unpack and you know you you always think you're about to hit the boundary and the the end of the line and the end of the rainbow and then you're wrong yeah you haven't and you just find someone who's just doing something totally out there because then you just start asking more questions what if you do this what if you do that what if you take this concept and you do it differently and it's just you know it's turtles all the way down man so here's here's the plan. Next time you guys go to Japan, I'm going to go with you guys and we'll do a audio diary of the trip and put it out Sick. in a series. You know what I mean? Let's do it. So, so here's the deal. Yep. We all are going to stay and we all stay in the same hotel room. Great. To save money. So it's going to be all all four of us because we always take staff in one uh japanese businessman hotel room so that's uh what are these like 100 square feet neil yeah, with a, yeah with a twin like bed <laughs> twin bed and the way we do it is every day we draw straws to see who got who gets the bed who gets the hallway who gets the bathtub <laughs> i'm in i'm in just for the stories you yeah. know what i mean just for the stories man i'll tell you no nothing better than sleeping on a desk after drinking with canto all night <laughs> <laughs> um let's get into okay let's tell everybody where you're at you're in oakland and santa fe you're on uh standard and strange on um on uh, instagram how did you get that name i have one of my many special interests and obsessions over the years was urban planning 
And like, I went down a rabbit hole and that I, like, I tried to break the industry, never worked out, but there's a woman, an author, Jane Jacobs. She wrote a book that everyone should read called life and death, the death and life of great American cities. And we were trying to name the store and we had a lot of very bad names and I'll never tell you what the candidates were because they all sucked <laughs> until I was reading that book one day. And there's this passage about, um, and I'll send it to you, just how in a city you find the new next to the old. There's old uses for new places, new uses for old places. You'll find the standard next to the strange. And we were opening in a space that had use, that was originally the Oakland Municipal Stables wow. that had turned into storage lockers that had turned into our store. And it was like the ultimate urban reuse, like tied to the philosophy of that book so deeply and when i read that paragraph i was like this is it like the standard next to the strange and then we kind of threw this idea around until we came up with standard strange the name great name great name and i also love uh what you guys do on your website a lot of uh community support with the gay lesbian and the black lives matter and very outspoken about uh fuck the people that are racist or homophobe or anything hey man we love all and and i love that about you guys also yeah. which is uh just a, a great great uh you know message to get out there you know don't shop in here if you're a piece of garbage yeah well yeah. we and last year we really leaned in to kind of using our business as a platform to express our values of us as humans. Right. And we were never really had the confidence or we were never really sure how to do it before 2020. And once the lockdown happened um, and just everything that happened last year, you know, George Floyd was murdered and just, it was just this huge upheaval. We just sort of said, fuck it. Let's, yeah. um, and let, let, let's like plant our flag on the ground. Like we stand for what we think is right. And it's yeah. not just about selling our clothes. And so we'd send out these emails to our list, like saying like, Hey, like, you know, we're paying our staff two hours a week to like volunteer on some activism, whatever they want to do. And it ended up being like a lot of phone calls to politicians because we didn't want to just, you know, reshare stuff on Instagram stories, form of activism. Right. We wanted to actually like, you know, make phone calls to politicians and, and do like, or like I would do canvassing uh, during the last round of elections in California. And so we end up having a lot of racist customers expose themselves and wow. say like, like fuck black lives matter, like all lives matter. Or, you know, don't you know that like this group is funded by George Soros and it's all this like, you know, crazy racist conspiracy. And so we had to fire a bunch of them as customers. Wow. <laughs> Just ban them. That's great. Yeah. That's and great. I took, I volunteered to be the guy who answered those emails. Yes. Um, yes. And Oh man, like the emotional labor of being on a firing line of those customers was, you know, it's no joke to have these guys coming at you. And our policy now is that we don't interact. We just take them off the mailing list and fire them as customers. Like they just can't buy from us anymore. Block, we'll block them. <laughs> and we just, you know, like I had these back and forths where people are like trying all of these obtuse arguments with me about how we gave money to, to Black Lives Matter or to the ACLU. And what I found is you push them hard enough, sooner or later, they start yelling the N-word at you. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. super, fat, like, it just kept happening. And you know, at the end of the day, I was like, you know what, I'm not going to give these guys the time of day. Like, we explored interacting. Yeah. And no, them, I just move on. Yeah, yeah, now we just, you know, we donate money, we move on. And actually, just yesterday, Dean, I was... Uh, putting together our page on the, on the donation and, and fundraising we've yeah, done. We forgot to mention that we started donating 2% of our monthly revenue to charity. Awesome. Which is we, a lot for a store like us with retail margins. Yeah. Right. That's well, revenue too. It's a chunk. It's that's, a chunk. That's, yeah. That's not yeah. profit. That's right off the top, a dollar in two cents out all, yeah. always. And so I was writing it up yesterday. We did nearly a hundred grand last year plus money we raised through our charity raffle, you know, and this year we're just ripping along. We did a charity raffle that raised 37,000, I think for, um, COVID relief funds. Like you yeah. buy, you send us a receipt saying that you gave 10 bucks to a COVID relief fund. You're entered in the raffle. You know, you wow. get 500, you get 
50 entries. And the, we gave away some huge prizes, like three full outfits, leather jacket, shirt, jeans, and boots. Amazing. Amazing. To three people. Yeah. And we've got a big announcement later this year on, on more fundraising stuff. It's like, we just keep giving and, you know, so I don't get to buy a third yacht this year. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> None of us are buying yachts. I mean, I have <laughs> It's a thing where like we we didn't get here on our own where we are today. We were helped along the way by so many people. Right. And once, you know, COVID happened and just the absolute carnage and destruction and just how fucked up yeah. that situation was where so many people were just put in these really awful places that and it wasn't even their own fault. We wanted to stand up for what we thought was right and help out other people. And it was really important and, to us. Well, like, I want to give credit to our staff here too. Yeah. Oh my God. Jim. Yeah. They really pushed us, you know, all of them, uh, you know, especially so Mari is super political. Elliot is Jan is they're all like, they really pushed us to believe in our politics and to put them to the forefront. You know, it's, it's been a team effort. It's not just the two of us in a corner smashing our keyboards. It's like everyone here pushed us to be better and then we have worked really hard to be better and better yeah. your staff is incredible it, i mean it's just your staff your store uh you guys everything in the shop the vibe it's just next level and i i i'm so glad that i went in and uh, met you guys and i mean i was super burnt and i was like i've got to do this i'm never going to get to this store this is the time. And uh, I got in the store and it was just an electric charge in me of like, wow. And I, I wasn't burnt at all anymore. We ate some tacos. We talked clothing and we just freaked out on each other. We smashed just, so many LaCroix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We drank so many of those. And then you guys came to the show, man. It was great. The show was, that was fantastic. So yeah, good. It was a great show, dude. We had a great time. Yeah. Uh, you know, no, we're we're glad a, we we got to connect too. Like it's for us, it's about the relationships that you build, right? Yeah, it's not yeah. it's not just that, it's not about money. It's about the connections you make. Yeah, that's you know? really what it's about at the end of the day, and just the uh, the French the new friendship. You know, it's like oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, and uh, to see people that get it. Your store is just like. Look, it's not for everybody, but the people that love that stuff, it is going to be a goddamn field day for them. You know, <laughs> I love it. And I can't wait to uh, watch your progress. And I'm going to go to that Santa Fe store somehow when I'm out on the road doing. Yeah, comedy. please get down there. See Cedro. Like, let us know. Maybe we'll fly down and meet you. Like, you got to meet the guy. You got to meet our team down there, too. They're incredible. Yeah. Like. Yeah, CJ and Darnell are great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Once Here's again, it. it's standard and strange on Instagram and the website. They have a one of the great things of the website is if you're into a jacket, let's say an N1, you can click on uh, a history of the N1 on their website and i'll tell you who wore it, where it came from what is the history of this i mean the knowledge on the website is fantastic i was down the n1 yeah. rabbit hole this morning because i love the n1 and i had seen those photos before which i love of the outlaw biker clubs wearing them and of course paul newman and everybody james dean that wore the n1 over the years and it's cool to see a website really go the next level you know, so everything you guys are doing is not surface. It's deep, deep stuff. I love it. Thanks, Dean. Thanks. Thank yeah, you, I'll Dean. leave you. Dude. I'll leave you with one thing: is yeah. that a much wiser person than me told told this to me years ago. And every year I think about it, and it just rings truer and truer. And it's that a business is the expression of the values of its owners. And if you look closely enough at nearly any action that business takes, you can see those values. That's being expressed, right? That's, that's and like real. it really, like the more, you know, when he first told it to me, I was like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I get it. You know, and then like some time went by, I was like, oh, I get uh, it more. I get it more. Right. You know, and it just keeps happening over time. Yeah. Like it really sinks in. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. I love now before we go one quick thing, favorite jacket on that rack back there, both of you guys. So <laughs> vanishing Why, point, Dean? vanishing point. That's my favorite jacket. Yeah. What's that one? What's vanishing that, point? That's uh, a collaboration that's... we do with Simmons built. That is an undyed veg tan horse hide leather oh, jacket. Oh, I, I don't that. have one out here. Yeah. I, I don't have it. one out here, but yeah, that, you know, it's so, it's like, which is your favorite child, right? I know. I know. I and just like it, to throw it out just in case the place like, is on fire. You can only have one jacket. What is it? Mine would gra- be. Okay. Yeah. I'm grabbing a fountainhead. All right. All Although right. It, you know. Yeah. 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 Mine would be the real McCoy's J100 psycho with the stars on the arm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I got it. I, I mean, if it. we had if we had the J24 in stock in my size, that's the one I would grab. But they, we are so back ordered on that that. I need the one with the buttons again. I sold mine because it was, uh, you know, the the oh the down down yeah. the J thirty one. Yeah, oh, the big stunt, the big the big damn. Ooh, with the zip down. Mean? I might have some news for you. Yeah, you're getting it coming in, right? We're, the hound's tooth. Yeah, we ordered it. We're like, it's time. Let's, I had uh, one. I had one, and it was. Uh, I sold it like, man, I don't know if I could, you know, and now I'm like, nah, fuck that. I'll wear that Civil War looking jacket, you know what G31, I mean? G31, man, that is an advanced jacket. I know, I know. There's a great photo of online of Jeff Decker wearing one, and it just looks right. Once that thing yeah. breaks in and, and, and slops over, you know, it's good to go. <laughs> yeah, it's such, man, I tried one on the first trip to Japan. I was like, this. It's so cool. It's so cool. And no one wears it. That's why it's cool. Everyone's afraid of it, but I know. Like it, it's it, to me, it's it's kind of like a super engineer boot. Yeah. Yep. Like we've been we've been selling engineer boots for years and years. And when we first started, people were like, I don't know. You know, on the shelf, they look so intimidating, like so macho, right? Yeah. But then once you put it on, they it looks totally differently, and the feeling and the experience of wearing them is so unlike a lace up. Oh, and yeah. that's what I love about the engineer boots. And now it's one of our like best selling types of boots. Hey, what's that and, pant I got? It's my new favorite on the planet. What's the brand again? Mo- Momotaro. I have a whole story about Momotaro too, but the, what that, is it? that's the, it's the Momotaro. Well, it's a moment. It's the Momotaro tight taper, the zero three zero six dash V and a 15.7 ounce Zimbabwe denim. Um, don't worry. We'll get you more of those. It's so, so like, good. Those guys, so Momotaro is part of a company called Collect. They make so much of the denim you see in Japanese denim brands. Like they are the one stop shop. Wow. So oftentimes, if you see like a random factory made denim brand pop up, it might just be somebody contracting with Collect. But those guys were one of the first people we met in Japan and they took us all over um, like Okiyama. And just like everywhere we went to a barn, like a metal barn in the countryside full of shuttle looms. Wow. They took us to their dying facility, to their, like to everything, to their little sew shops. And they were so incredibly nice. And then they drove us back from the countryside to Okiyama city and took us out for dinner and we got pizza. And I think it was, was it, we got, we, they said they were going to take us to the best pizza place in Okayama. And then they apologized profusely because they had to take us to the second best pizza place because the first one was closed that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, <laughs> and well, they also, they took us to, this is a great just Japanese hospitality story. So the regional specialty for Okayama is, um, tempura udon and it comes screaming hot with this crispy tempura whatever shrimp vegetables um in this very clear broth and they're like okay we know a spot so we're driving out in the countryside we pull up to what looks like the bottom of a hill to like somebody's mansion on top we go up the steps there's a converted old really big i would say like early meiji house maybe older so like early 19 early 20th century maybe late 19th century and we go in there and you have to sit on the floor of course and we've been in japan now for i've been there for like three weeks 
everything hurts. And they see us just like flopping around like big Western idiots, just like, God, not another, you know, I'm trying to like fit my, like physically jam my legs in the table. And the host is like, hold on. She turns, pulls back one of those big paper doors. And there's a secret room just for Westerners with a Western style dining table. Like it looks like somebody, somebody took it out of a farmhouse in North Dakota, right? This massive Western dining table with regular chairs. And she's like, Oh, come, come, come sit. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm six foot three and about as flexible as a two by four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah. And I'm, <laughs> I can't hang for very sit, long. Sitting on the ground just sucks. You're like, Hey man, yeah. I need some back support. You know, yeah. I mean, I love a little bit of sitting on the little on the little cushion on the tatami mat, but I'm just too big, and yeah. my legs just don't bend that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, those jeans are fantastic, and they were the first company that did what I've been not understanding why companies don't do forever a 32 length out of the gate. So when you do hem them, you don't lose the shape where everybody else does like 36 lengths. So by the time you cut five inches off, it just looks like a barrel. You've lost the shape yep. of the jeans. Yeah, you lose, you lose the taper. Yep. Yep. And yep. it looks horrible. It just looks like a straight, like just barrel. And so I couldn't <laughs> believe when I saw it. And it's definitely the brand I'm going to be wearing from now on. It's just great. Oh, we got you. Don't worry. Those come in like 12 ounce to 20 ounce. I can't you wait know. to get, get another pair. All right. So I will see you soon. I think I might take a road trip up and uh, see you guys again. And uh, maybe when that Buco comes in and we'll have some dinner and lunch and uh, love it, enjoy it. Uh, I might come up on my way to Sacramento. I'm doing some gigs up there and we will uh, we will hang out again. Thank you so much for doing the show. It was a great episode. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, many years of success for you guys. We need you around. Thanks, Dean. Thank you, man. Thank Appreciate you so it so much. Thank you so much. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Yep. Have a good one. See you later. See you, Dean. Later.